Hi, and welcome to Crash Course Cryosphere. I'm Simon. I'm Tom. And I'm going to let Tom explain what he's doing this week because you're not going to see very much of me. Thank you very much, Simon. Yes, this week we'll be looking at a bit more of mass balance and then linking mass balance to climate change. Don't worry, there will be more of me in the future. Great. Using the concepts of accumulation and ablation, we can now look at where ice is lost and where ice is gained in the glacial system. The first thing that we must address is where the glacier will be fed. So this will be where the accumulation outweighs the ablation over a whole year. So there's a net gain of ice. This is where the ice and snow is coming into the system, essentially. And this is known as the accumulation zone. In a simple valley glacier, the accumulation zone is nearly always at the head of the glacier. This is the area up in the mountains. The two basic reasons for this are the mountains are higher and therefore colder, and also you get more precipitation there. You get more precipitation in terms of orographic rainfall, i.e. the type of rain that you get when an air mass rises over the mountains. Of course, there are other factors in the high mountains that can contribute to accumulation, particularly in regions like the Karakoram or the Himalayas, you get a lot of snow avalanching off very steep valley walls onto the head of the glacier, and this contributes to it being an accumulation zone. It doesn't just have to be delivered through snow. The net gain of ice we've just described doesn't mean that the accumulation zone will just keep on growing until you've got a huge ball of ice up in the mountains. The accumulation in a perfect system will always be balanced by the outflow of ice through transport processes. However, these perfect systems are very rare in reality, and particularly in today's changing climate, other things happen. To demonstrate the anatomy of a typical glacier, Tom is now going to show you something he's been working on for quite a while. It's a bit of a pet project, and you might be able to tell he's quite excited to share it with you. Here we have our pet glacier. This pet glacier is Gary the glacier, and he's in fact an Icelandic glacier. This is partly because the way we've modelled him is with this kind of plateau, very flat type mountain around him, which is mostly due to the fact that the foam sheets came in that shape and it was easier to carve it that way, but also because I've spent a lot of my time in Iceland in terms of glacial research. I'm a big fan of their glaciers. So we have the glacier, Gary the glacier, sitting in the valley here. The first thing I want to point out to you is the accumulation zone. So in this case, the accumulation zone will probably ending at about here. It's at this point where you stop seeing snow and ice on the tops and the, uh, in particular the sides of the valley, indicating that the summer ablation is starting to remove most snow material from this point downwards. Above here, we have the headwall of the glacier, or the headwall of the valley, I should say, where the glacier has carved into the back. And beneath here, you can't see it because it's beneath the glacier right now, we have an overdeepening where the ice is carved down off the back wall of the mountain and come up again and up over the lip where it flows down valley. We can see this point where it comes flows over the lip by these crevasses which are on the top surface here. So that's the accumulation area of Gary, but his ablation area is further down. Here we have, as the ice comes down out of the mountains, it's losing altitude and moving into air that has a mean annual air temperature of above 0 degrees Celsius. Essentially, this is what the ablation area is. As it moves down out of the valley, it hits a break in slope. As it comes out of the mountains and onto the flat plain, it spreads out. This is often called a Piedmont type lope glacier, or Piedmont, depending on if you can pronounce French or not, which I certainly can't. The reason why it spreads out in a lobe is because as it comes down off the valley slope, it goes from moving under its own mass, down the slope, to being on a flat plain. So the only movement is taking place primarily due to the weight of the ice coming in behind. And remember, ice is a plastic solid, so as it comes in, it will deform and push and spreads out in this flat lobe type shape, usually leaving lots of crevasses around the front due to expansion and brittle failure. We also have more crevasses as it comes over this break and slope, again, due to brittle failure. Now, down in front of Gary, we have his proglacial landscape. So this is the landscape in front of the glacier. It's no longer covered by ice, but it is still strongly affected by glacial processes, and the shapes and forms that you see in the landscape there are due to the glacial processes that took place on top of it. Immediately in front of the glacier, we have moraines. Moraine can mean several things in several different languages, but fundamentally here, moraine is a contiguous body of sediment that has been pushed up and shaped into a sculpture by the glacier. In this case, these are terminal moraines, so they follow the shape of the nose of the glacier as it spreads out into the valley below. In these moraines, we have small gaps in them, and this is where the proglacial fluvial rivers have cut through the moraines and wound their way out across the valley floor. 
And finally, in our particular landscape that we have here, we have some drumlins. Now, drumlins are supposed to be my favorite landform because that's what I did my PhD thesis on. But once you've counted 32,000 of them, the, the love is lost a little bit. The drumlins here are aligned where the glacier would have been flowing. So they've spread out from the lobe. So that was Gary the Glacier. I hope you enjoyed your time with him. I certainly have. And let's get on with the rest of the episode. As we descend down the glacier in altitude, ablation processes will become more important. We start to lose more ice than we're gaining from accumulation. The point at which we cross over from this accumulation to ablation zone is known as the equilibrium line altitude. This equilibrium line altitude, or ELA, is a very important concept that we're going to come across a lot in future episodes, particularly in relation to changing climate and the cryosphere. As with the accumulation zone not just piling up ice, in the ablation zone it's not just melting away to nothing. Instead, ice is flowing into the ablation zone from the accumulation zone and replacing the ice that is lost. To look at these processes at a larger scale, the glacier mass balance, as opposed to the specific mass balance at a point, is the balance of the ice mass being gained in the accumulation zone and the ice being lost in the ablation zone below the ELA. The precise cycle is determined by the local climactic regime. So this could be a whole series of factors ranging from very local effects as to what side of the mountain you're on through up to regional climate and global climate changes. In our simple model of a stable, perfect glacier system, the amount of ice accumulated is exactly the same as the amount of ice moved downstream beneath the ELA and exactly the same as the amount of ice removed through ablation below the ELA. That's the stable, perfect glacial system. In this episode, we've talked about how we view information changing spatially, such as temperature, but the way that we look at the world isn't the only way that the world can be viewed. And we have some examples of a different viewpoint here. So what are these? Well, these are replicas of some original maps that are held in the National Museum in Greenland. And they were, make, they were made by East Greenlandic people. They were collected in the 1880s. Now, perhaps if I just hold one up slightly, you can see there are all these kind of ridges and maybe it's not obvious what it is, but actually it's a map of an island chain and a series of coastlines. So if we have a look at the thing you've got here, what we have is a map of the sort that we know, a uh, top-down view, uh, it's got the contour lines and various things marked on it. And you can see how both of these relate to those island chains. So for every lump and bump, there's an island or a, an inlet that it relates to. And it's not linear in space. So some of these islands are much further apart on, on our map than they are on this. Mm -hmm. um, but these were very successful used for navigation. So they just looked at the world spatially in a totally different way. Absolutely. And the way we think about the world has completely shifted because nowadays we've got the Earth on our desktop, pretty much. Um, Google Maps, satellite imagery has totally shifted the way we do things. So how often do you go, oh, I need to get, get somewhere. I'll just plug in the directions and you get this top-down map. And it's how we think of the world. It kind of affects the way you think as well as the way you live your life. It's a very empirical way of viewing things like distance. It's a, it's a very, it's this many metres apart. Uh -huh. This is it's something that's a bit more experiential. It is, and they're designed to be tactile, so they're very much expected to be something that you feel, and mm -hmm. you use that as your input sense, if you like, um, which obviously a 2D map like we have isn't going to get you very far. And these are quite surprisingly modern. These are from the late 19th century? That's right. They were collected in the 1880s from eastern Greenland. So people might think that, uh, might incorrectly think that it's a primitive way of looking at the world. It's not. It's just a different way. Yeah, it's absolutely. Still, considering these people... Um, navigates considerably better than Westerners did for a very, very long time in the same <laughs> conditions. Maybe we should be using these maps. Well, perhaps. I think, like you say, it's just a different way. But if you think about as Westerners with all our, of our advances, prior to what, the 1960s, aerial photography hadn't really arrived in most people's world. So for most people, it wasn't a top-down view. You would remember the things that you saw around you. We'll be back in the archives next week with what I can honestly say is the box of rocks with the most interesting story I've ever heard in my life. Now though, Tom is talking about glaciers that grow and, perhaps more relevantly, shrink. In the previous section, we considered the perfect glacier that isn't growing or shrinking. But one of the reasons why we're so interested in glaciers today and glaciology in general is because in a changing climate, that isn't the case. So what happens to the mass balance of a glacier under a changing climate? Why is the climate changing again, Simon? Never fear, Tom. The real scientists are here. So a succinct definition of climate change would be changes in the concentrations of chemicals in the atmosphere which are radiatively active at long or thermal wavelengths. 
changing the energy balance of the Earth, such that more energy is absorbed by the Earth from the Sun than the Earth re-emits into space. This change in the energy balance then increases the total energy of the Earth system, raising the planet's temperature and changing weather and climate. Back to the gravel monkey. He is useful sometimes. If the climate changes so as to increase ablation, for example, by increasing the temperature higher up in, the alt in altitude, and therefore losing more ice that way, or by reducing accumulation, by changes in snowfall patterns, reducing the amount of snow going in, then we see a net loss in ice. The mass balance has changed, the ELA shifts, and the glacial system is now in negative mass balance. Of course, the converse can also be true, and if you see increased snowfall patterns in your accumulation area, then your ELA will move downstream, and therefore you get an advancing glacier. However, for the majority of glaciers at the moment, we're seeing a loss of mass. The primary way that we can visualize the impact of climate change on the mass balance of a glacier is by considering the ELA and the accumulation and ablation zones that we talked about earlier. It is the change in the relative sizes between the accumulation and ablation zones that dictates whether or not a glacier will be advancing or retreating. In the case of a glacier that is in a negative mass balance state, the ice will continue to be lost from the ablation zone until that ablation zone has moved far enough up the system that it is no longer significantly larger than the accumulation zone. And therefore, at this point, the glacier is now once more in balance, and the net gain loss is once more zero. The key methods for monitoring glacier mass balance change are the direct method, hydrological, geodetic methods, and gravimetric methods. Direct measurement is done via accumulation and ablation stakes. This is where you literally go to the glacier, hammer a stake into the surface, and then come back regularly to measure the change in either accumulation or ablation. Obviously, this is a pretty old school method and generates only point source data sets, which then have to be interpolated from. The hydrological method is based upon the concept that the annual mass balance of a glacier represents a change in the hydrological state of an entire catchment. Therefore, if you know all the inputs and outputs of this catchment, you can calculate the net mass balance. However, this is a pretty hand-wavy method because it's very difficult to actually know what all the inputs and outputs are. In the geodetic method, you use repeat satellite or aerial photography that's very similar to the sort of stereo photography that was done in World War II for reconnaissance to calculate changes in volume. This change in volume can then be converted to mass with assumptions about the average density of snow and ice. Obviously, you're making an assumption here, and that's always a dangerous thing to do in science. And therefore, whilst this method is very good for fairly rapid, quick, and repeat mass balance monitoring, there are accuracy problems. And finally, we have the gravimetric method. This is one of my personal favorite methods, mostly because it's so cool. In the gravimetric method, we're actually directly monitoring the gravitational field of the Earth and the changes in it. This is done via a pair of satellites called the GRACE satellites that are flying in low Earth orbit. The reason why this method's so cool is that for the first time, we're really directly monitoring the change in mass. All of the other methods, we're using volume and then extrapolating from that, we're interpolating from point measurements. Here is a direct measurement, continuous measurement, of changes in the Earth's ice mass. And that's both very useful and quite cool. In this episode, we've covered the Equilibrium Line Altitude, or ELA. This is a really important concept, and it's an imaginary line where the ablation and accumulation zones meet. That the ELA is important when determining if a glacier is advancing or retreating, that is, if it's getting bigger or smaller, and that a glacier's response to climate change depends on the balance between increased ablation due to higher temperatures and changes in accumulation due to shifts in precipitation patterns. Thank you for watching Crash Course Cryosphere. If you have any questions about the material we've talked about in this episode, then down there in the comments, Tom and I will be battling it out trying to clear up any misconceptions for two hours after this video is released. And if you'd like to take your understanding further on any of the subjects covered, there are links to further reading in the description. We'd like to thank, as ever, all of these lovely people for helping make this series possible, and in particular, the Recover Project at, at Exeter University for funding us, and to the Scott Polar Research Institute at the University of Cambridge for being so accommodating to us. We'll see you next week.